Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. friends and listeners, and welcome to a new episode of the Thos Hermes podcast, episode number nine of season eight. Wow, what a week this was. Anniversary week, as you all know. And well, this is the fourth episode within seven days that you guys are going to receive here. And well, you know what makes me really happy? It is that, um, well, I thought, yes, well, there's four episodes. There will be, of course, per episode, a little fewer downloads because people might not have the leisure or don't want to hear four episodes in a row or whatever. No, it's really great. They just, all three that I launched so far uh, worked just as well as the regular Sunday ones, even a bit better the one with Lionel Snell that was something I think many people were very happy with and expected for quite some time that Lionel would be on this show. So I am very, very happy and thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being so um, attentive and listen to all that. And also the launch of Kaikobad Radio happened this Wednesday. Of course, that will need a lot of work still to build it up. And what I only would like to ask you all you listeners of the Thoth Hermes podcast, go there, listen in and spread the word. That's what the new channel always needs most in the beginning. Uh, I have to do some work on spreading the word, of course, myself. I have to make the website also much better. and But that's all work in progress and it has to go step by step. I have a day job, you know. So, But I'm very happy and what makes me happy that on the radio station there are so many of my podcast colleagues who have agreed to be part of that project. So that's not only nice, but will also make this Kaikobad radio really interesting. And it already is. So f- glad to have you back here on the podcast. And today my guest will be Terje J. Simonsen, who is Norwegian. And we are going to speak about something that as part of the Thoughts Hermes podcast, as by its definition and subtitle. But actually, it's the first time that they really speak in depth about the paranormal, because um, I only want to do that with people who are serious enough about it to do a great job. There are, of course, many people around, but I haven't had yet the time and the, the, the moment to speak to someone like that. And it's really great, Terrier. You will see he's a great guy and We cover a lot of ground, not only on the paranormal, but of course, a lot about that. Okay, and um, well, thanks to all of you who have chosen to become patrons also this week, two new patrons of this show. And please go to the Patreon site, look for Thoth Hermes Podcast. If you like what you hear, and many of you seem really to like it, go there, do become a patron starting from $1 per episode, you can become one. And we do need your help. We do need your support. Um, That's very crucial to help this thing going and just make it sustainable. Um, On the website, I have to say that, of course, the Hermes website I'm talking about here, T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com. That's thothermes.com. You will also find a link where you can listen to Kaikobad Radio. Um, So go there if you haven't done so yet and have a look and listen to it. Um, Honestly, the show notes of this show and of the last two supplementary shows last week are rather short because it was just for me to do a a lot of work to do this week with the radio launch, with the anniversary episodes. And so I kept the show notes a bit shorter, but especially today, There is an article, a highly interesting article, that we also speak about in the interview. 
that you really should read if you're interested in the things that we speak about in the interview into serious observations on the paranormal. Uh, it is by a scientist who did that. And um, so don't miss out on the show notes on this show, but of all the other shows. And while you're there, why not listen to some of the older shows you have not heard yet? Must be some among the 122 that you can find there. So, um, well, what else do I have to say? Nothing for the moment. Yes, do give me feedback. Please do give me feedback and send me music. I need more music for this show. I always find nice music. I did so this week, I think. But um, I'm always keen to have your music, the one that you wrote, you perform. So it's really nice to have you participate in this show that way. So please help me with that. And now let's go into the first piece of music here right away. And um, this week um, I have some music that's well, I would, it's certainly not classical music, but it's a kind of music that's classic among pop rock music. Let's put it that way. The first piece is called Everywhere and Nowhere. And it's by an Indian artist by the name of Biraj. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Biraj is based in Delhi. He's a pianist and music producer and featured on many uh, of those uh, websites. The, the, the piece we are going to hear today, Everywhere and Nowhere, is from his album that's called At Odds. And, well, I believe you are going to like that. It's kind of cinematic a bit. Just listen to it. And we have three very different pieces here today, but all of that veen, a bit classical, a bit orchestral and... or dreamy. I hope you like all that. So let's start with the first piece of music now, Everywhere and Nowhere by Biraj, and that's from his album At Odds. Enjoy.
Everywhere and Nowhere by Indian composer and interpreter Biraj. I really hope you enjoyed it. It's, I think it's lovely music that he produces. Thank you so much. And now let's turn to the paranormal. A short history of nearly everything paranormal. That's the book uh, that Terry J. Simonson published. Well, actually, as you will hear in the in the podcast, this version with the title I just gave you is already its third version of that book. Um, but it's that third version that has become a real, real hit. Uh, subtitle is Our Secret Powers, Telepathy, Clairvoyance and Precognition. And um, as this is also part of the mission statement of um, the Thoughts Hermes podcast, I think it is about time that we talk to someone who is really seriously researching in that, uh, in that matter. Um, Terje, he is Norwegian. He is an historian of ideas and also a nonfiction author. And he specializes in the esoteric and the occult. And as we will hear, his occult knowledge is really deep. And he has written a lot about people like Michael Harner and Carlos Castaneda and Rudolf Steiner. So he's really the guy to create a link between, well, if there has been a link to be created uh, to the between the occult and the paranormal. But in any case, it's really him who we can talk about this. He's also educated in Gestalt therapy and psychosynthesis. And he is... Uh, since childhood fascinated by the magical phenomena like telepathy, etc. Maybe I just read to you a little excerpt from the introduction to that book, as I often do, that gives you an idea about our interview here today. The chapter of the introduction that I'm reading you part of is called The Paranormal. Well, what else? Experiences of telepathy, precognition and related phenomena seem a poor fit with the typical modern, rational Western worldview. But statistics show now the least regard for this and impertinently insist that more than half of us will have experiences of this kind during our lifetime. Experiences of something beside the normal, namely something paranormal, para meaning beside. So statistic would suggest that paranormal experiences are in fact quite normal. These phenomena could be said to belong to the twilight zone, the borderland of consciousness, a sphere that we may have a vague notion about, but that most of us are not really familiar with. 20 years ago, the American Psychological Association launched the mapping project in the exciting book The Varieties of Anomalous Experience. And here, a number of psychologists wrote about quirky themes such as lucid dreams, out-of-body experiences, telepathy, precognition, healing, and other strange experiences that are not in harmony with our usual perception of reality. However, it becomes evident from the case studies in this book that such experiences do not have to be confusing or intimidating, but in fact can also be deeply meaningful. For example, many people experience a new and more serene relationship with both life and death, after so-called near-death experiences, where one typically has a feeling of leaving the body, being enclosed by a great light, meeting deceased family members, angels or other spiritual beings and the like. So you see the way he writes is also a very easy reading, but um, with a lot of in-depth thought. And uh, I really, really liked that book. It's a, it's a good compendium to say he speaks about archaeology and parapsychology about anthropological perspectives of it he speaks about historical glimpses from the relationship between occultism and parapsychology um, he speaks about um, skepticism as well so there is really a wide wide field that we that we find here in this book and it ends all in chapter nine called our paranormal daily life so if you want to know more about that, do get that book. I also will, of course, post the link on the on the web notes, on the show notes of this of this page on the website. The show notes of this episode on the website, Rudolf, get it together. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. 
Yes, well, I think the best is I let now Terje speak. It's about time. And let's go to the south of Norway, where Terje lives, and meet a uh, uh, lovely gentleman, Terje J. Simonson, and let's speak about a short history of nearly everything paranormal and many other things. Here comes the interview. Now we have a premiere here, finally, I must say, on the Thoughts Hermes podcast, because uh, even if it reads on the subtitle of the Thoughts Hermes podcast that we are dealing with, yes, the Western esoteric tradition of cultism, mysticism, but also the paranormal phenomena, um, it is the first interview that I do with someone on that topic, on the paranormal itself. And I'm very excited to have somebody here with us who is, uh, I'm very keen to speak about this too. Um, and we have gone to Norway today and we meet Terje Simonson. Good evening, Terje. Nice to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Rudolf. Very nice to be invited. It's great. And um, well, the 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 reason, so to say, for this interview is a book that I think was it's in its third edition until it became the book that, that I have here in front of me. It's a book called A Short History of Nearly Everything Paranormal. And that's quite something to say. And we're going to talk about a lot of what is in that book. And um, it is a beautiful book of 500 pages, roughly um, a paperback of 500 pages. So there is a lot, a lot of highly interesting material in it. And Terry, we're going to talk about many of those. Uh, I'd like to open, before we go a little bit into who Terry Simonson is, uh, open with a question because I saw in the first edition of that book, uh, which is, dates, I believe, eight years or nine years back, um, you called it in the, in the subtitle, you, you called it Our Ab Secret Abilities. And then uh, with the second and also the third edition, it's called Our Secret Powers in the subtitle. Mm -hmm. um, is this just an editorial thing they did? Or is there <clears throat> something in your mind that changed when you revised the book that made it from abilities to powers? Uh, interesting question. Uh, if there is a reason behind it, it might be uh, that my Nor Norwegian publisher, Pox Publishing, is a very academic scholarly publisher, you know, and uh, to just for them to open up to the reality of the poem normal is a great stretch in itself. Uh, so somehow, uh, you know, abilities uh, is a bit weaker than powers. Softer, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit softer. So, and since my editor, uh, she is, I have just... Uh, excellent uh, things to say about her, but she, she called herself a moderate skeptic. Uh, so somehow to appease her concerns that we are not making a new age woo woo book, mm -hmm. we are making mm -hmm. something serious, scholarly serious. Uh, therefore, we uh, I somehow uh, <laughs> made it true with these uh, abilities, but I don't know if I would have made it true with powers. But when going international, you know powers is more powerful as the words indicates so uh, then I, I i went for that say a bit more strong expression and you personally you would so you you would see it as the possibility of powers and uh, in your in your personal opinion i mean Yes, it is powers, but it's also abilities, an ability to run fast or to play music. It's also a power. It sure. can help you win races or get uh, uh, good uh, promotions in, in the opera world, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I know, so, right. so, so there is no, no contradiction at all. It's just, say, the weaker version and the stronger version of the same, uh, yeah. having something that you are able to do, which uh, gives you eventually powers if you develop it. Uh, of, over time, yes. Absolutely. So now let's speak a bit about yourself. I always like to know a bit about the reasons of my guests here on this show, why they write those books or why they practice what they practice, whatever their, their, their mm. speciality is when they come on this show. So um, what Terrier brought you to be interested in the topic in the first place is that a long lasting story did it happen at some point suddenly or what brought you into that realm and why did you want to write that book 
Mm. Uh, well, you know, uh, when I was a young boy, I, I somehow heard stories from uh, people around me and uh, people I trusted uh, that told about, say, things and effects that did not, uh, say, were part of our syllabus at school, you know. So, uh, but I was still and, and, and had not, uh, say, no um, reason to disbelieve what they told me. As I said, uh, trustworthy people in in a say Christian youth club I was a member of back then and also my grandfather he was a machine engineer and uh, he had never set his foot uh, neither in a new age fair or in a church or anything you know uh, except for when he was baptized and he was buried you know so it was, mm. he was not a religious man but he uh, he had a strange ability or eventually power to hear beforehand when my grandmother uh, was coming uh, from uh, uh, home from town um, uh, and that is a Norwegian uh, old phenomenon called Vardøger it's uh, if you read uh, folkloristic uh, things from Norway you will find that phenomenon quite often described in fact there is a Norwegian professor uh, in biology Georg Hugen who has made a book about this phenomenon uh, because if you do statistics on it you found it's more common uh, it's reported from all over the world really but uh, it's more common statistically speaking in Norway than in other countries for some reason I don't know why that is mm -hmm. but uh, my grandfather would be sitting in his living room and he would uh, hearing uh, some uh, thing uh, someone approaching the door the door would open in the first floor there will go so he will hear someone going up the stairs top 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 and then someone would open the door to the second floor and no one was there Uh, and uh, what then happened uh, was, and this phenomenon could it could happen early on the afternoon, it could happen late in the afternoon, it could happen early evening. So it was not in kind of uh, it was not bound to a specific time of day. But the strange thing was about half an hour uh, this phenomenon uh, happening. Then my grandmother would come home from either from town or from a friend or from some family visit or something she was not uh, having regular work so so as i said it was not a fixed uh, time of the day so uh, as i said half um, half an hour after this vardöger approached the house uh, my grandmother would come and this happened so regularly that my machine engineer grandfather he when he heard this vardöger he immediately went to the stove starts making dinner because okay. <laughs> he, yeah. he he knew it was uh, half an hour about uh, before she, she would come physically. Right. So, you know, it was a very down-to-earth, it was non-sensationalist, this thing. Uh, it's just, uh, as I said, a matter of fact from a very rational down-to-earth man. So why shouldn't I believe that, you know? And as I said, he was also quite bright guy with, with his uh, engineering. He was the boss of a mill here in in in, uh, in Christiansand. Then. And also, uh, yes, also other phenomena are like this uh, for instance um Uh, my aunt and uncle, uh, uh, I could mention several stories. I'll just give one short. Um, they were in bed at nighttime and my uncle had went to, uh, gone to sleep. See, he, he was sleeping. And my aunt, she was reading a book. It's a kind of famous in the Nordic countries. It's a Swedish uh, history work, uh, 20 volumes uh, from Grinberg. And she was reading something about the old Egyptian and there was a stela uh, with some figures and there was also a text under that so uh, and while she was reading the text under that figure my uncle started speaking in his sleep and my aunt was reading some words uh, as I said under this figure and the exact same words came out of the mouth of my sleeping uncle okay yeah that's fascinating yeah very fascinating uh, I would of course call that a kind of spontaneous telepathy yeah. and uh, yes and the first uh, phenomenon with your grandfather that was what we could call precognition mm. um, uh, and, uh, the paranormal it's a very wide uh, world of course because we can uh, ETs aliens ghosts whatever uh, I have focused in my book on uh, what is usually called the psi phenomena mm. and psi is uh, so in, in uh, the literature of uh, parapsychology usually it is telepathy 
clairvoyance, precognition, and uh, healing, and psychokinesis. That's the most, it's called the f- big five. Mm-hmm. And so, um, as I said, with my aunt and uncle in sleep, that is spontaneous telepathy in my reading. And also this uh, with my grandfather, that is a precognitive uh, uh, event. So these kind of phenomena. And also later, I, I, um, I read an article in Norway's most serious, uh, say, daily journal. It's called Often Post, uh, Often Post the, meaning the Evening Post. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was, uh, he had uh, visited, uh, I think it was f- about five different uh, psychics. And this journalist was not at all impressed, except for one. And that uh, psychic told this journalist that you are planning now to go to a, a, on a journey and you will visit two specific big towns but I can tell you it will happen so that you visit uh, these towns in the opposite order of what you have planned and in fact that happened because the travel agency had made some mess you know so he had to uh, yeah and yeah. this uh, this psychic also said and I can see that you will have very good use for the new camera you just have bought and in fact he had just bought a new camera and also and I can tell you there will be coming a priest asking to join you on this journey and in fact a short time before the journey this priest ap- approached him and said can I join I want to visit some Christian friends in North Africa, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is, so he was blown away by the psychic. So I think that's my man. I have to talk to him. So I was about to go to a date and I called this, uh, he is an old traveler uh, and probably uh, you know the traveler. Uh, it's kind of like the gypsies. They're living, you know, in wagons and uh, right. uh, in uh, it, uh, what is called uh, mobile yeah. homes or something like yeah. that. Yeah, mobile yeah. homes and, mm-hmm. and and they have camps and you know so in winter time they go for instance to Spain then they come back to Norway yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff mm-hmm. that's the traditional uh, lifestyle mm-hmm. as the name indicates so yeah. they are not gypsy by, by, by genetics uh, yeah. but uh, by lifestyle yes. traveling people so to speak yeah, yeah, yeah. Y- yes mm-hmm. some say they have uh, ancestry back to the soldiers of Napoleon after his uh, see he, his campaign in Russia back then okay. they, they deserted and you you know, uh, ended up in a German uh, forest, Schwarzwald and so, and went together with the gypsies and learned their lifestyle. And also they have a language which is quite close to, to, to uh, you know, uh, the, this, Roma, um, the uh, Roma language. Yes, uh, yeah. yes, yes. The Roma <laughs> language is called Romanus mm-hmm. and the, the travelers have what they call Romani. So ah, that's okay. a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, they have also, uh, just with, as with the gypsies or like the Roma, they have a very strong culture for these phenomena. So... As I said, I was uh, contacting him and I told him about the date I was to go to very soon after this. And I told him, please tell me about this date. And as, uh, he described the lady quite well. Of course, a general description. He said, hey, she likes you quite a lot. It will be very nice and so. And then he said, I can also tell you, this woman is one meter and 64 centimeters tall. And I think, huh? How do you know? Well, I just know, he told me. So I went to date this date. Uh, it became very nice. We chatted all along, good contact and so. And, you know, I, I couldn't keep myself back. So during the night, I casually asked her just by coincidence, oh, by the way, how tall are you? And then she said, one meter and 64 centimeters. You know. Amazing, yeah. Yeah. Re- really amazing. And, you know, next day I couldn't, uh, I, I just, I had to call him, of course. And I said, you were right. How did you know this? And he laughed and he, he, he we somehow, uh, I don't know if he used uh, the word Google there, but his explanation was that it works just like Google. When you asked him a question and uh, he focused on that, it suddenly would appear lots of uh, information related to that theme. It could be more or less well sorted you know it could have been for instance her father's uh, beruf uh, mm-hmm. occupation it could be the hair color of her brother or whatever but what appeared to him for some reason that he didn't know or i didn't know was her height yeah. and then he 
could somehow just uh, after focusing he could just be in the receptive move and take what was somehow delivered uh, uh, to him and pass it on to me which he did uh, and I was impressed okay so it's working some kind like a search engine on the internet as yes it was like that so but uh, how do you know that and, and he didn't know but he told me I'm taking it uh, via your subconscious mind and uh, okay yeah okay I, you know I would question quite new to the theoretical aspects of this so I just nodded and, and so but would that mean that you are reading my mind in a way then yes I can do that if you're a good channeler he told me okay let's try it I said and then he was uh, we were on the phone this and he was on holiday uh, out in the Atlantic uh, Ocean uh, at the Canary Islands you know so he had not the possibility to just uh, you know take the drawers and see what my house yeah, yeah, like. yeah. and, yeah, and yeah. I did not give him time to go on the internet check with Google Maps or anything so uh, I said um, I will now visualize my house the front of my house and you please tell me what you see and I will tell you and uh, our audience that my house is an old scruffy thing it's from the 17th century and it's a white uh, old uh, all old houses here in town uh, the old one are white really uh, and in the middle of the front there is a big blue double door and that is a quite uncommon uh, color here in Norway mm -hmm. um, in, in Greece it's very common if you go yes. to Greece it's bl yeah. blue doors so or yes all over but the it's, all, it's all red normally in, in red yes. and white right yes yeah. yeah. but if you if you go to the old uh, doors here in this town at least it's green that's ah, the okay. traditional mm -hmm. color yes so mm -hmm. uh, so as I said it's a kind of particular color for, for our town this um, so uh I started then visualizing my house, this white big wall and the big blue double door in the middle. And after I had done that for a couple of seconds or the three or four seconds, I said to him, now I'm visualizing my house. Please tell me, what do you see? And he became silent for some seconds. And then he said, ah, I can see something white and I can see something blue. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and then I think this is for real. This is just not coincidence. He gave me the exact height of the woman I dating on the centimeter. And he also, without the possibility to prepare anything uh, or, you know, asking leading questions, looking for subtle signs or anything, all the skeptics always bring up as explanations, you know. Yeah. Uh, he was able to, yes. So he gave... Uh, uh, excellent answers on, on on both these things so then i started to study parapsychology uh, the science about these phenomena because there's lots and lots of laboratory uh, experiments oh, and yeah. also uh, yes uh, and uh, even in some universities in freiburg in in germany they have a very strong milieu for these studies also in amsterdam and also in some university in london and also in scotland in edinburgh uh, uh, the famous author uh, arthur köstler uh, he he somehow donated his fortune to uh, to make a, a chair in parapsychology. Oh, really? And yes, uh -huh. he did. He was quite rich man, I think. He, you know, he was very famous for his books. Uh, oh, absolutely, yes. In the days. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so they have a very strong milieu there. Uh, also in some universities in the US, Duke University uh, uh, was famous for that and also a couple of universities in, in, uh, in Australia. So there is, it's not a big milieu, uh, scholarly mi uh, milieu for parapsychology but it uh, does exist and they have some excellent researchers with uh, uh, doctoral degrees in both in in, in uh, psychology and uh, in physics so I, uh, I, I read yes uh, at, at what moment in your career you were trained as a historian also cultural historian I believe yes right? yes and um, did this interest in the paranormal happen at the very beginning of your career in that field or did that come a bit later in your life I, I would say you know these stories with my my my, uh, my grandfather I mean, my uncle that's his childhood stuff sure uh, yes um, but uh, you know I had uh, I had this uh, I would say parallel to my academic studies my own uh, studies uh, because also I was dating a woman uh, when I was in my 20s and doing my studies and she was very intuitive just by looking at a picture of a person she could tell uh, lots and lots uh, of information about that uh, you mm -hmm. know so, so I somehow 
happened to 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 um, by chance uh, encounter people uh, having some of these abilities. So I would say it's parallel. And also, uh, as a mentor at the university, I got Professor Jan Erik Ebster Hansen, and he is, uh, or at least was, he's uh, emeritus now. Uh, he uh, was Norway's biggest expert on on occult and esoteric uh, stuff. Right. And he, yes, his his doctoral degree is on Jakob Böhm, the great German uh, mystic, course, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, an early theosopher, or what we should call him, I'm at least a great Christian mystic. Yeah. Uh, so, and and uh, in Norway, we have. Um, a great tradition uh, going back to Rudolf Steiner, this famous Austrian teacher. Yeah. And uh, Rudolf Steiner himself, I think he visited Norway uh, two, uh, two, uh, on two occasions at least. And also um, uh, many, we had a milieu of uh, artists and uh, writers uh, somehow following the teachings of Rudolf Steiner here. And my mentor, when he was a young man, he was part of one of those milieus studying the, the, the writings uh, uh, of Rudolf Steiner. So he said uh, there is this journal called Janus. It was made by a Norwegian writer uh, called Alf Larsen. Later he became, uh, he was uh, uh, during uh, the occupation uh, in, in Norway, he was uh, not uh, say, not a national socialist, but you know, he had some issues with the Jews mm-hmm. for some reason. So mm-hmm. he, is, uh, he is a bit admired, but also a bit detracted here in Norway. Yeah. And I think both is deserved, you know. He is, uh, was very competent, but he had some shady sides as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but this, uh, uh, there had been no uh, real good academic study of this anthroposophical journal, Janus, which had lots uh, of influence on Norwegian culture. So my professor, my mentor, Jan-Erik Ebster Hansen, the doctor of Jakob Böhm, he said, this someone should do. And if you don't do it, it, there will come some other guys. So I suggest you do it and I can be your mentor for this project. So, oh yes, right. great. I had 20 other ideas. You know, I'm uh, my strong side is creating ideas. Uh, my weak side is perhaps realizing them. So but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think many can recognize themselves. Uh, I, was gonna say, I know the feeling. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I can imagine. So, uh, um, but uh, so I, uh, for three years, I was going deeply into this and I made a dissertation about this journal and of course then I had to study quite a lot of esoteric tradition to know uh, of course Rudolf Steiner he was an original mind with direct uh, revelations or what we should call them uh, uh, say an open portal to the big mind or the spirit mm. world or whatever we should call it but also of course he was steeped in tradition uh, both German tradition but also Renaissance occultism and yes. uh, uh, of course more uh, this uh, was recent was a theosophical tradition from Madame Blavatsky mm. and he had studied Indian tradition and of course uh, Christian mysticism and the Kabbalah and, and Gnosticism and everything. So to understand Steiner you have to also study this other tradition, at least some of it. So that is somehow my personal interest for this hidden world the occult traditions also then went into my academic study so I made a, made a dissertation about this which later became a book. So it went hand in hand with my, uh, say, more hobby interest for the paranormal. Um, and after writing, I have written about a bit about the Kabbalah and also uh, written about this uh, old um, esoteric, uh, it was a Jewish, uh, but also had some influence on, on early Christendom, uh, this uh, first book of Enoch. Yeah. Um, yes, it's uh, usually called the Ethiopian uh, book of Enoch, uh, right. because it was rediscovered in the late uh, uh, in 1773 I think by by a Scottish uh, Freemason and explorer um, I don't remember his first name and his last name was Bruce and he went to Ethiopia and he redis- rediscovered this book and uh, that has been uh, away from the West uh, since uh, uh, antiquity really mm-hmm. so uh, I, I, uh, I organized the first Norwegian uh, translation of this book and we you Is know that the story of the two pillars of Enoch, with, uh, which were hidden for the flood, is that uh, is that the story in this book? Uh, no, uh, the, the central theme. All is uh, no way. I'm getting very theoretically, but it's it's uh, basically fa- five books. It's 
modeled after this uh, uh, Pentateuch, Pentateuch uh, this okay. five, yes, the five book of Moses mm. in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's a kind of esoteric alternative to the books of right. Moses in a way. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, what the uh, is, uh, book of Enoch uh, is most famous for is uh, there's a different story of the fall because the normal Christian version is that uh, uh, Eve is tempting uh, Adam with this fruit and he eats and they're thrown out of paradise. It's uh, disobedience making uh, the humanity fall from uh, grace and from paradise. Yeah. But uh, what is uh, in the book of Enoch is a cosmic fall because it's uh, 200 angels, uh, great angels, archangels. They are lusting after the daughters of man. Yes. So uh, they are going uh, and uh, down from heaven to earth, falling down from heaven to earth and uh, procreating with the women. And uh, the, the offspring is monsters called Nephilim. The famous Nephilim, exactly. Yes, yes. yes. that's Nephilim, mm-hmm. the fallen mm-hmm. ones. The fallen yeah. ones. So yeah. that's, that's a very central theme. Yeah. And also what the book of Enoch introduces in Western uh, tradition and probably also therefore in Christendom, it's, it's uh, at least one, say, source of this is that there will be a judgment after death and there will be uh, people coming to what we could call heaven and also a punishing place. Uh, and, uh, you know, the all uh, uh, old uh, Jewish tradition, then uh, after death, you are entering Sheol. And yes. Sheol is as uh, like the, 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 the hardest uh, in the Greek. It's a world of shadows. Um, the Greek tradition have also a punishing place called Tartaros, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with this Sisyphus and uh, uh, different kind of, uh, yes. what is K, uh, kind of a punish, uh, b- 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 re- refined punishment for uh, really big sinners. But mm-hmm. normal people d- 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 do not uh, end up in Tartarus. They go to Hades. And also in uh, the Jewish tradition, there is no hell in the old Jewish yes. tradition. There's Sheol. Uh, but in the book of Enoch, there is a kind of hell. It's not called hell, but it's a netherworld where the fallen angels and those who following their evil ways will end up. And that is kind of new. So it's very influential. And you can also see the book of Enoch is quoted in the New Testament. And people, most sure. people do not know that. Many theologians, they will be very surprised if you tell them that. So I felt it was kind of task for me to uh, introduce um, to, to, to the Norwegian public the book of Enoch. So I organized a translation of this book from Gez, which is the old Ethiopian language. Uh, only four persons in Norway master this language on an academic <laughs> level. So I get to uh, <laughs> grab one of those and please yeah. translate this text. And I also wrote an essay. So I have that, that is also part of my esoteric study going into okay. the Enochian tradition. Yes, because as you know, probably uh, in the Renaissance, the Enochian tradition were somehow revitalized uh, through the work of uh, John D and yes, Edward sure. Kelly. Yes, sure. yes. yes. And the later, language course, and yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. The mm-hmm. alphabet uh, and so. And later, we of course had Alistair Crowley with his Enochian magic and all that. So exactly. it has a subculture, an esoteric subculture in in, in European, uh, say, law. This <laughs> exactly, which has also transposed itself a lot to the United States then later on, of course. Yeah. Yes, with the golden do- uh, via the golden door tradition. Right, exactly. Exactly. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. So, so I studied that also uh, the Golden Dawn and all these things. So, so some, somehow my hobby, uh, f- uh, interest for the paranormal, and my academic interest for the esoteric tradition went hand in hand. And somehow I think it's uh, made kind of a synergetic effect. So yeah. I, 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 I use my personal interest in when as an academic and as an anchor. Because as you said, uh, there's uh, probably a good reason because uh, five years and you have net. Uh, yet to have one speaking about paranormal stuff because it's so much bogus in there. So, Indefinite. and my father, he, yes. And my father, he was, um, a natural scientist, a biologist, um, and uh, uh, my grand- one grandfather was, as I said, a machine engineer. My other grandfather was a medical doctor. So I come from a, what they call a realist tradition in, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, here in Norway. I'm not into basically this uh, woo-woo. I, I, you mm-hmm. know, we are not a family of 
hushes smoking, uh, hippies uh, yeah. chanting, uh, Hare Krishna and uh, that stuff. So yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I tried to, to, to go into this and be very open-minded, but at the same time, uh, keep my scientific uh, balance here. Uh, which I'm sure is not always easy for you yourself. I'm sure it's it, you, you are used to it now, but from the outside, from the academic world, I have, I have asked this several people like Hendrik Bogdan, who you probably know from yes. Sweden or other people who are into the esoteric and occult currents and study them, but are academics. Um, Carol Cossack was lately on the show as well. Uh, it is sometimes difficult to be accepted on one side by the academic community as being a serious mm -hmm. academic and on the other side write about those subjects. Uh, how is your personal experience with that tension, so to speak? Uh, that, that's good. And that brings me back to what the first asked me, secret abilities, secret powers. And as I said, my, my, my uh, publisher uh, was a kind of scholarly publisher and also my editor, she has called herself a moderate skeptic, as I said. So, uh, um, and she always, when I went uh, to, uh, were too believing, as she said, uh, then she said, uh, uh, I may, uh, let's make good science here. So, uh, Uh, I think it. I think I made that balance quite well, and also I was very happy uh, because my book was uh, positively reviewed in uh, the journal of the Norwegian Medical Association, and they are definitely, yeah, they are definitely not New Agers. So, yeah. so, uh, so I think, and, and what is at the core of my book is, uh, of course, uh, I will not say a new model, but at least to academics, uh, it's a new model of consciousness uh, because. The, in esoteric traditions we uh, we all know there is uh, many many traditions that operate with a co concept of consciousness uh, as a collective field of information basically it's not an individual th thing just going on inside my head, head. and there I uh, use the metaphor the mental internet it's more like a internet of information you are connected to via your consciousness via your say biological PC uh, which is your brain but they are not identical at all All. Consciousness is far, far uh, bigger and larger than my individual uh, ego ever will be. And that is in the old Indian Vedanta tradition. It's in the Jewish Kabbalah. It's the Gnostic tradition. It's the Hermetic tradition, you know. So it's all over the place. But as you say, it has been uh, not been uh, come ill for within, uh, say, modern academia. Yeah. Ex except there are some, uh, some uh, what, uh, good exceptions there. And I always uh, some I just sent a link to it today to an uh, uh, say a program host in the BBC in, in Britain uh, it is an article written in 2018 uh, published in the most prestigious psychological journal in the world it's called The American Psychologist and it's the flagship journal uh, mm -hmm. of the American Psychological Association and that is by a professor in, in psychology Etzel Cardenia he is Mexican, but he's ten tenured in Sweden, and he has written more than 300 scientific articles. So he is a very, very solid researcher. And he uh, have uh, he had, had this article published in 2018. Uh, it is called "The Experimental Evidence for Parapsychological Phenomena," and uh, he concludes: Yes, there is uh, sound and solid evidence for the existence of at least some of these phenomena. But no, we have not yet reached a model that everyone can agree on, an explanatory model that everybody can agree on. So, and when you publish and get something like that published in the most prestigious psychological in the world, that speaks volumes. So, okay. when people say, you, you meet a kind of semi-professional skeptic, say, oh, but there are no sound and solid evidence for these phenomena. Well, I can tell you, there is so people should read this article and then they will see then and he suggests lots of different uh, possible models uh, uh, mainly based on the interpretation of quantum physics because the phenomenon of um, say non-locality uh, which is observed in the quantum world that two electrons continue to be bound together even if they are kilometers apart and that is experimentally proved in at least yes. uh, three different uh, cyclotrons uh, in the world so that is a hard science and uh, say um, by extension he suggests that uh, what if consciousness itself 
is a non-local phenomenon and uh, then these phenomena w- would be much uh, easier to explain so i think within that framework it's possible uh, my uh, as I say, i'm a historian not a physicist so i will not be the one to judge which is the uh, say uh, r- correct model here but i launch in my book five different possible models uh, wherein it's possible to interpret uh, telepathy clairvoyance and so on in a meaningful and scientific uh, way so but people should really uh, of course they should read my book but they should also yes. read this article of Etzel Kardel well if you if you would be kind and send me the link as well for that article I would be happy to post it on the show notes for our interview so that people can go and read it beautiful I will do that thank you yes and as I said already in the intro to this episode and as we just said in the interview do go to the show notes and find that article that we were just talking about. It is really highly interesting. And now it's time for some music again. And as I told you, well, let's call it classic rock fusion, what we're going to hear now. Um, it's from a band called um, uh, a band called Break of Reality. Sorry about that. Um, Break of Reality. And, um, well, they are an American cello rock band because it's three cellists and um, a a, a percussionist that play together. And it's really, I I really like the music that they do. Um, The piece we are going to hear now is, is called The Farewell. And well, it's a lovely piece. Enjoy. It's it's really great to listen to. So the farewell uh, at first now, and then we're going back to meet Terry Simonson for the second part of the interview, of course. And after the interview, as usual, a third piece of music. That's a very different style. It's by an Irish-born artist called Patrick Usher. I hope I pronounced that correctly. The double S. Um, he he makes that makes it a bit different from what I would expect. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, And he is a musician as well as an author. He writes books about stoicism, for example, and about reality. He he, but he is also without formal training, but a composer. And his music, is, he writes, is composed by ear. And it's really lovely. From his CD, Life's Sweetness, we're going to hear Una Nueva Alba. Um, very dreamy. That's the dreamy of the three pieces, as I said in, in the beginning. So, once again, now break of reality with the farewell. Then the second part of the interview with Terrier Simonsen. And after that, Una Nueva Alba by and with Patrick Usher. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
there is a sentence to underline what you just said. Uh, there is a sentence in the first chapter, I believe, of your book. And I have to read that because it's exactly saying what you just said. Uh, we consider the possibility that paranormal phenomena, or at least some of them, may be objectively real. So that shows really the academic prudence that, <laughs> that you were using here. We consider the possibility that they may be objectively real. So it's, yes. it's really very... Um, and you can feel, I say, I, I could feel that by reading the book all the way through that you are very, um, you're going sometimes on tiptoes, but not too much. But I mean, just saying, well, that's a possibility. Mm. It's, mm. we have to see, mm. right? And I yes. think that's, that's the feeling you have with it partly, haven't you? Uh, uh, could you please repeat the last and that's, I think that's the feeling you have yourself partly, right? That you have to be uh, uh, careful uh, with some uh, things. I would say, I, I personally, I'm totally convinced about the mm. reality of, if, if, for instance, telepathy, clairvoyance, and as I said, precognition, and also healing and psychokinesis. But of course, not every story told about these things are real. There's much uh, bogus, and uh, people have slept uh, bad that night, or they have uh, uh, taken LSD or whatever. So when people present a story about about these uh, uh, paranormal uh, phenomena, you cannot take it uh, for granted that it is real. But uh, uh, as I said, both from pers personal experiments and also from reading the experimental evidence, uh, as an example given uh, Cardenas' article and uh, mm -hmm. much, much uh, all the uh, scientific evidence, I'm convinced about uh, the reality but uh, uh, of the phenomena as such. But as I said, there's so much bogus and so much uh, con artists here you know and magicians you were wanting to pose as uh, as uh, real mediums and all that kind of things so so therefore i try to be extremely balanced when pre presenting that um and also uh, this guy i was so impressed uh, by uh, he who could tell me on the centimeter the the, the mm -hmm. height of the woman i was dating uh, he can also have bad days when he has slept uh, yeah uh, and he is his uh, abilities or powers uh, uh, are not working at all so i'm open to these things uh, the subtle impression here so you have to uh, go a bit tiptoe not to be too blunt about uh, the statements absolutely you know always when i do those interviews in the introduction before uh, that people hear when before they hear the interview i read a little excerpt from the book that i'm presenting and in this case i have read uh, uh, this, this little chapter magic and modernity right mm. uh, um, which I find just by its title already, it, it is very interesting. So you were talking about occultism. You were talking about your personal knowledge and background in that. We are talking about the paranormal here. Where do you see the crossover A between paranormal and occultism as such? And how does, as it is described in that, uh, in that uh, short chapter that I read, magic and modernity fit together? In what sense is it a modern way of expressing things? Uh, a very good question. And of course, I should not have uh, only a couple of minutes to talk about that. But, uh, you have all the time you need. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, it's a different aspect because uh, there is the phenomena, of course. But if we know uh, are a bit uh, culturally history, uh, cultural historians here, if you see the, the mentality of magic, uh, what is that? That is, uh, if you compare to the Christian or at least to some part of Christian, tradition. Uh, if you have a monk in uh, medieval ages, uh, for instance, uh, okay, what is uh, virtue there? You, you should be humble, for instance. Uh, is a magician humble? Drawing down the powers from the stars, making the world submit to his will. Is that humbleness? No, it's not. It's a total different uh, uh, mentality. And uh, also, uh, if you go to modern science, uh, let's bring a man to the moon. Is that humble? No, it's not humble. And also, uh, if you let's create artificial life, it's not humble at all. And that is also part of the magic tradition. You know, the homunculus, which Goethe writes about. Oh, yeah, the golem, it, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Golem yeah. in the yeah. Kabbalistic tradition, yeah. homunculus in, 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 uh, in Faust, in Goethe. Yes. In, uh, yes. yes. So the magic mentality, it's a man mentality of power, you know, uh, and that is uh, very different from the 
typical uh, humble Christian mentality. Uh, so there is, uh, and if you go to, for instance, um, there's a famous uh, German philosopher, Hans Blumenberg. Uh, he wrote a book, I will try on my German here, Die Legitimität der Neuzeit. Um, and he wrote about what is, uh, say, the essence of the modern project. Uh, and he found that, uh, he has found that uh, in his interpretation in the Middle Ages, um, uh, in, uh, in uh, a the- theological tradition, interestingly enough, it's called voluntarism, uh, where God is not like, in, for instance, in Thomas Aquinas, where he is a kind of cosmic philosopher in a way, uh, uh, and uh, rationality is God foremost uh, ability or power. But uh, voluntarism from uh, Willem of Ockham, uh, where God is will and, 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 and power to create, really. And that is also, and, and, and uh, when Blumenberg looks into the modern, uh, say, modern mentality, that is just this, uh, say, <laughs> power hungry mentality he is into. He feels that that is one of the characteristics of a modern m- mentality. And that is, the, uh, say, quite similar to what we find within the magical tradition. Of course, magic go back to antiquity. Uh, the Egyptians have uh, magicians and uh, the Magi in the, in the, the New Testament uh, visiting the child Jesus when he was born, uh, bringing gifts, you know. So we had long uh, magical traditions. Uh, but uh, it's it somehow, uh, as I said, there is a different mentality if you go to the normal, say, uh, pr- uh, devotees of uh, religions. Uh, they are more into service. Of course, there are this uh, in Renaissance. Uh, if you go into high magic, uh, there is to be to service to the to the greater good for the cosmos, uh, of course. But there is a difference, as I said, in the mentality. So that is part of, of that. And you, if, if you know, go to uh, Renaissance, for instance. Um, also in magical tradition, uh, numbers, for instance, uh, uh, is very important in magical tradition. Uh, the Pythagorean traditions, uh, numerology and mathematics. And what is the tool? What is the tool that modern scientists use to somehow conquer the world, to uh, send a person to the moon? Yes, it's mathematics. Yeah. Y- yes. Math- mathematics is not just about uh, rationality. It's also about instrumental power in a way. And that is also found within the magical tradition. So you have... Proportion, uh, proportion and Pythagoras and all of that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Y- yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, so uh, numbers, uh, not just as contemplating uh, insights into uh, the universe, but also mastering the universe uh, and uh, an engineer. Uh, he or she is using mathematics to, to get uh, attain a physical mastery of, of, of yeah the mastery of the physical world so uh, and that as I said you have the mentality of magic uh, and mathematics and what is characteristic of um uh, of uh, of modernity, if you said, where should we start the 15th century to until 17th century is um, of course then we go from astrology uh, to to uh, what we say to astronomy uh, and there also mathematics is very important uh, to to predict uh, uh, the say. Mm-hmm what is called its uh, celestial bodies, the movements, and also uh, in chemistry, uh, we're going from alchemy to modern chemistry. And there again, mathematics to master uh, the chemical world. So so, uh, the mentality and mathematics are very important in in magic tradition and also very important in, in, uh, in, say, modern science. So in a a way, you you could argue strongly, which also some cultural historian, uh, Francis Yates, for instance, uh, Mm. she made a very very famous book called uh, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Traditions. Yes, and she, yeah, and she a classic. found yeah, yeah, yeah. a classic, yes, cultural classic. And uh, according to to, to her uh, argument, uh, you find uh, these also uh, say the basic tenets of of uh, modern science uh, are found within the magical tradition, not in the Christian tradition. Uh, and also, uh, she made a follow up. Uh, it's a book to the 
this uh, Giordano Bruno book. Uh, it's called uh, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Enlightenment, yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, because um, uh, across the divides uh, of the different religious um, confessions, you know, Catholicism and uh, and uh, Protestantism of different brands, uh, Lutherism, uh, you know, uh, Anabaptism, and the different kinds, so you found this um, tra- say tradition of uh, Rosicrucians uh, that uh, was really a kind of occult science, and she found that um, uh, the Enlightenment uh, is somehow rooted in that tradition where people without uh, respect to dogmatism t- uh, tried to find what is the truth. And that is an see, occult project because if you go to the Catholicism, they will demand you believe in the Virgin Mary and that kind. And if you go to uh, the Lutheran tradition, they will have uh, uh, Sula Gratia, Sula Feed, and you know, the different tenets of the different... Uh, but... Uh, mm-hmm. Ideally, in the Rosicrucian uh, tradition, it's finding the truth about the universe. And that is actually what science is about. Absolutely, so, yeah. Occultism and science, uh, magic and science are very well connected. And also Goethe, he was uh, what you can call a diagnostic of the time. And he also found that Faust is uh, somehow incarnations. Uh, Faust is both a, a magician. You've, uh, in Faust 1, for instance, it starts out uh, after the Celestia, you do the choir in, in, in heaven or so. Uh, you, found, uh, uh, f- you find Faust in Studierkammer, where he is doing magic, you know, uh, this pentagon and uh, and all that stuff and he is also a scientist so which you also describe in your book I may say That's yes, the, yes 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 mm-hmm. so so uh, culturally founded in cultural history is a very close relationship between magic and modernity magic and and, and modern science absolutely well thank you Short that, that, that <laughs> exactly I have to quote the line from a friend of mine uh, Olaf Redra who will be publishing a book on gnosis very soon and mm-hmm. he said uh, to me actually I just wrote it down because I found it so beautiful. Those who are looking for the divine on the outside of themselves will always stay slaves, and <laughs> and that's the way. What what you're saying? You have to you have to be looking for the greater good or for the greater experience like flying to the moon or or doing magic and that's exactly mm, what yeah, it yeah, yeah 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 mm. yeah 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 uh, let's go back to to your book because um, you dropped just a few names like goethe or uh, but there are also names in which are at least to me uh, where coming as a surprise in in the context of the paranormal um, and i would like to, to 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 take two groups of people one where well, maybe Jung was not a real surprise, but Sigmund Freud uh, was uh-huh. a surprise. Um, so maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about um, the psychoanalysts and the paranormal. Maybe that would be a nice uh, way. And then later on, I'll ask you another group of people that I was surprised to find them. Yes, uh, Jung, uh, uh, as uh, many people know, he had very strong paranormal experiences himself uh, from childhood. Uh, and if people want uh, the best introduction, is in his own autobiography is called uh, Dreams, Memories, uh, Considerations. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, uh, and uh, there he will uh, uh, say, uh, initiate uh, you in uh, his own experiences of a very strong paranormal. And also there were some people, his father was a, a, a priest uh, or not priest, a Catholic, but a Lutheran priest of some uh, confession. Yeah. I don't know if he was. Uh, he a was a Calvinist, Calvinist, I think. Calvinist, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. But some, uh, some brother of his family uh, were spiritists and uh, practicing mm-hmm. spiritism and uh, he relates uh, uh, for instance he uh, once uh, he experienced that a tree was uh, cut in half from top to bottom you know like that and uh, he related that to spiritistic activities uh, done by his family and he also studied spiritistic medium at least eight spiritistic mediums close up for many years and he also participated I think it's for a period of 30 years in spiritistic sciences himself so he had a first hand strong experiences uh, with with the paranormal and also uh, as many of uh, uh, our audience probably know he also 
made a book uh, about synchronicity, meaningful coincidences, together with this great uh, physicist, Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli, yeah. uh, quantum physicist, quantum pioneer, who won the Nobel uh, Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for his theory about spin in atoms in uh, 1945. And they made uh, so uh, cooperation where uh, Jung uh, described the paranormal for, from the say, psychological uh, uh, point of view, and Pauli suggested he was extremely careful, extremely tiptoe, uh, because he is called the consciousness of science. So he could not, he said, I might have uh, rejected something that was uh, right, but I have never accepted something that was wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. he was extremely careful. Uh, so uh, Jung, as I said, described, uh, suggested uh, how, uh, say, meaningful coincidences and paranormal phenomena could uh, appear from a psychological point of view and, and Pauli from uh, the physicist point of view. Uh, Freud, as you said, that is a bit more uh, <clears throat> unknown uh, because very often, and at least in my when I started, uh, you know, we have a kind of pre-study before we go to the university. It's called Forbredner, means, means preparing study, really, exfil. And uh, then I re- remember reading Freud, and he said, we have to stave off the mud of occultism, he mm-hmm. said. Yes, I uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and that is very often quoted. But what they did not know was that he had researched telepathy for several years, uh, together with his Hungarian pupil, Ferenczi, and he uh, also had a kind of telepathic experience uh, with his uh, his wife when uh, before they had married when they were engaged he was in one town and she was in another and he felt a strong telepathic uh, exchange with her and at one occasion and he also said uh, to a um, paranormal author uh, uh, <clears throat> And when he, at, at the end of his life, if I was to live once more, I would have st- studied parapsychology and not psychoanalysis. Oh, really? mm. Yes, he said. So and he was also good friends. I don't know if you know the person with Friedrich Eckstein here in Vienna. Um, Friedrich Eckstein was kind of a focal point of all the people uh, like uh, Karl Kellner and and Alois Mylander ah. and, and Rudolf Steiner was also very, very oh, close yes. to Friedrich Eckstein. He, extend himself Jewish as well and um, yes so Freud was good friends with him and I think he was also a bit uh, maybe not influenced maybe that's too big a word but he got a, a lot of information about the occult about esoteric movements ah, from that, that side yeah, yeah. Mm. interesting connection yes mm-hmm. of course Vienna culture at that time had lots of uh, esotericism and, and, and occultism uh, Steiner most prominent example but, but also in the cafe culture you know there were lots and lots of the, it was en vogue uh, occultism after uh, theosophical tradition and you also have in Prague you have Gustav Meyrink and so, course, so yes, yes uh, many of the cafe intellectuals uh, dabbled uh, with occultism of different strands yep. so yep. yes absolutely mm. and yes. the other group of people that I maybe a bit less surprised than with Freud but still um, you mentioned Steiner, Steiner, and that person I'm going to say now, we're both um, at the very beginning, my early 20s of my past, so to speak. Yes, um, yes. That's Michael Harner. Michael Harner, who you also give a chapter in your book on the paranormal. Uh, yes. um, he is very well known, of course, for introducing shamanism into the more into the big, bigger public, let's put it that yes, way. Yes. Um, mm. Why why paranormal uh, movements and Harner? How do you link him to that? Uh, well, he, uh, as you said, uh, b- 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 Michael Harner is uh, quite, uh, if uh, our audience do uh, not know him, he's a quite uh, famous uh, anthropologist and he is, uh, have, uh, say, taught at uh, different, uh, uh, say, prominent uh, educational institutions in USA, uh, USA mm-hmm. uh, for instance, at Yale University and, and other places also. Uh, so, but he went to uh, the uh, Amazonas, uh, the jungle, and, and uh, I think it was in the early 60s and he uh, tried the brew uh, it's a two component brew it's called ayahuasca and it's become quite popular uh, modern times uh, they have 
uh, you know, uh, ayahuasca uh, trips, uh, organizing uh, people going down in the jungle and living there for mm. several weeks, you know, and uh, uh, taking this and getting guidance from a shaman. Um, do you say shaman or shaman? Uh, no, I, uh, I say shaman, but maybe that's the European okay, way. Okay, then we use shaman. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's closer to the Norwegian uh, yeah. also. So, but yeah. uh, some, some. So for our shaman. American friends, it's shamanism that we're talking about. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, no, uh, so he he went uh, there and he also uh, he exposed himself to this ayahuasca experience, also combined with with um, with trance inducing drumming, and he said it uh, quite succinctly. Thank you. It worked. So he had experiences of that and he uh, has uh, conducted lots of seminars on healing and also he himself sees spirits. Uh, he uh, It's not just something that happened once when he was young and having, uh, say, been uh, taking this through. Uh, on a daily basis, he uh, somehow tune into the spirit world and is able to see spirits. With, he communicates uh, to facilitate healing, for instance. He have a patient and he visit uh, the spirit world to what is wrong with this patient, what can we do to to help this patient with uh, his or her energies and that kind of thing. And that is, I would say, a paranormal. It's not normal by, by social anthropologists doing that kind of rituals, you know, communicating actively with the spirituals and uh, spirit world and also doing healings. So that was the reason I introduced him. And mm-hmm. also because uh, I have a chapter about anthropology and, and yes. the paranormal, because very many, uh, much... Uh, more often than it is uh, reported very many of social anthropologists have had these kind of experiences visiting a diff- different indigenous people uh, in lots of uh, Australian indigenous people you know uh, aboriginals called and the Sami people in north of Norway and Sweden and Finland they have a very strong tradition for this but uh, as these phenomena uh, supposedly do not exist according to normal academic wisdom well, how, how are you to report them? Uh, then you are taken to be unscientific. Uh, so that has been a problem and um, underreporting of these phenomena. And there was a guy called Joseph Long, and he himself had a very strong experience uh, on Jamaica with this kind of uh, phenomenon. It was a group, just to make it very short, a group hallucination where more than 100 persons saw the same thing happening at the same time only problem was it didn't happen so how did that come about uh, so uh, and he at uh, he in 1977 wrote a very good book about this uh, paranormal and, uh, and anthropology and uh, on file at that time uh, he uh, said it was about a hundred different cases uh, where anthropologists have experienced paranormal phenomena but it did not become part of the official literature in the field because of this and that is what I called the emperor's wrath uh, because uh, mm-hmm. if you're losing scholarships, you are losing your tenure, you're losing respect of colleagues or mentors. You know, you will not report these phen- uh, phenomena. Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, eventually you could say it's part of a drug experience. Then you can somehow escape with it uh, still. But, but uh, you should be very careful. It will be a little footnote, you know, and not a big yeah. theme for for for, for a dissertation or something like that. Uh, but as I said, this uh, um, uh, this long uh, he uh, he also together with um, a very interesting uh, uh, guy uh, in in uh, in a Canadian anthropol- uh, anthropological society uh, Norman Emerson. He was a mm-hmm. professor and he did lots of uh, uh, excavation on and what used to be called Indian First Nations people of the of Canada, yeah. different tribes, First Nations people, and he very often used uh, a, a psychic called George McMullen and. Uh, Professor Emerson, uh, on 80% of where McMullen had said, there is a site uh, dig there, there is a site dig there. That's so, the archaeological uh, he, uh, experience. Archaeological right. yes. excavation, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yes. Uh, in the US, archaeology and anthropology is the same subject. Mm-hmm. It's a, sub, a different subdivision in the same. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. In Norway, and perhaps also in uh, in, uh, in the German tradition uh, and Austrian tradition, it might be, uh, say, separate. different departments. Yes, yes. 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, in 
in uh, American Canada is yeah. somehow uh, more yeah. coordinated. Uh, okay. Yes, mm. yes. So uh, Professor Norman Emerson used this uh, George McMullen, very uh, famous, uh, say psychic, uh, and he was very accurate. So he did lots and lots of finds, extremely valuable finds from an archaeological viewpoint, uh, and so he could not deny it. He was skeptic at first, but after having found, uh, uh, see, interesting. Uh, <laughs> what is called uh, villages buried and, and beneath the ground and also lots of artifacts uh, using this George McMullen's uh, psychic abilities or psychic powers uh, if, uh, if you like uh, he, he uh, decided this is for real and has, he has also written articles about this so uh, Joseph uh, Long and also Uh, also uh, Norman Emerson, also uh, Stefan Schwartz, uh, interesting guy. We cannot go into him now, but he also also done archaeological excavations yeah. based on, on information from psychics. Those three went together and made a kind of subdivision within the American Anthropological Society. It's called Anthropology of Consciousness. And there you have uh, some kind of license to speak about these phenomena without being declared insane. Yeah, that, yes. that's interesting. And that That's also what I find fascinating about your book, that you go in all those different fields like anthropology, what you just said, or uh, military. We maybe don't have time now to talk about mm -hmm. the military that uses parapsychology in order to in order to do their job, yes. so to speak. Right. Yes. Um, that's, that's fascinating because the book opens so wide and gives so many hints. And when you read it and you want to dig, maybe not in all chapters, everyone in all chapters, but you want to dig further in in the things that that really really are close to your personal interest. And so it's really a highly interesting read. Um, you, you mentioned something um, you, the, called the mental internet. I like, I yes. like that. Uh, I, and, and leading from that, um, I don't remember exactly now by heart the, the, the title of that chapter, but I said, what do you do when the, the computer has broken down? You buy a new computer to access the internet, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And so, and there you talk about reincarnation. Yes, and if the, con yes, if consciousness is not just something inside my head, uh, of course, if consciousness is just inside my head, when I die, then consciousness is gone. Yeah, but if it's something more like a mental internet, if your computer uh, breaks down, the internet is still there. And you can just, uh, if you have a blog, for instance, you can buy a new compu computer and continue blogging. And say I suggest the possibility uh, based on some uh, Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker in USA, uh, USA a famous uh, psychiatrist uh, they uh, have found that it seems to be say a continuation a reincarnation is of course more perhaps a religious term but a continuation of consciousness when the physical body dies consciousness is still there might it be that a newborn uh, child might say continue the blog of an earlier uh, person that has passed away i am totally open to that and i okay. think it's uh, uh, the possibility is supported by science and also the fact maybe that's not science what i'm saying now but um also the fact that you sometimes have the impression you know things not knowing just um mentally knowing but you have interiorized certain knowledge that you mm -hmm. can possibly not have made at a certain age or at a certain stage of your life so where does it come from where yes. why do you know certain things that you or have a talent which is extremely high uh, um, so you can ask the question why Well, how does it come in your life, right? Mm. And, and so many of these phenomena are much more easily explained if we uh, see them in the light of the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that consciousness is a, a collective field we all share. Uh, yeah. Then it's possible, then it's quite natural. Uh, I can go Definitely. to your Facebook page and see, ah, oh, Rudolf is writing an article about that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so. And uh, it's not, uh, the information is there. The problem is just being sensitive enough Access to it. download yeah, exactly. it. Yes. Yeah, that's, there we are with Jung again, of course, with the collective consciousness and, and, yes. and all of it. Yeah, right. Yes. Um, we, which is 
a perfect transition to my next and unfortunately already nearly last question. Um, oh. When you call, well, unfortunately our time is running short, but um, when you speak about um, uh, about mental internet, uh, yes. uh, what comes to my mind, of course, also when I think of Rudolf Steiner at the same time, um, is the Akashic field because he's, yes, he yes, spoke yes, and yes. wrote a lot about that. Um, mm. Would you compare what you call the mental internet to the Akashic field or is that something different and how do you access the Akashic field if it is different? Uh, I would say it's uh, a, a very similar uh, concept, uh, but uh, as you feel, is, uh, or chronicles, um, uh, if you go to the theosophical tradition, I think they call it the chronicles, uh, the chronicles, chronicles yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that's the recorded collective memory. Uh, all what has ever happened cannot unhappen. That is recorded in the Akashic chronicles. Yes. So if you're a sensitive person, you can um, uh, consult or visit uh, mentally the Akashic chronicles and download the information you need but that is not about the future and I, I don't know uh, yeah, if yeah. the traditional uh, no so that is then you have um, an even more expansive view of consciousness if you think consciousness is also a part of the future uh, that is uh, that is um, uh, a perspective I also suggest in my book uh, uh, my impression at least from the theosophical tradition which I'm not uh, an express expert of but I have read partly I know it partly at least then uh, as I say my impression it's more about what has been the Chronicles okay, yes. uh, it, it is it in the name Chronicles really um, so but but uh, uh, the Hungarian philosopher Erwin Laszlo he mm. uses uh, reformulates that theory and uses the uh, Akashic field or the right. zero point field yes and then we are more into the mental internet because um, uh, it is a non-local field of information and then telepathy if you have this view of, of consciousness, then a telepathy is something not very strange. It's something we should take for granted because yes. we are thinking in the same sphere, all of us all at the same time. It's just uh, being able to pick out the right thoughts or information from that big, vast field. That is the, the problem. Like a radio to tune in to the right frequency, Yes, right? the right uh, yeah. frequency, the right wavelength. Exactly. And the future aspect of this, this is also, um, then we have Go, to go into uh, what is called eternalism uh, or the B theory of time. Uh It, is, it was written in a philosopher called uh, MacTaggart, a Scottish philosopher, in 1908. He wrote a book, it's called The Unre uh, Unreality of Time. And he says, uh, and also Immanuel Kant back in the day, you know, he also said uh, time is merely a kind of, uh, uh, das ist uh, Ding für mich, not, uh, nicht Ding an sich. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. A, more a matri matrix that is made by my mind. Uh, but But uh, the see, deepest really reality exist. is yeah. timeless. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And if you think the deepest reality is timeless, uh, then somehow I, I, just to make it simple, I'm, I'm a lover of metaphors. If you go on a railway station uh, in one town uh, and you take the railway, you visit many stations on your way and then you end up the other town. Uh, uh, say it, town A and going to town B. Uh, But all the stations on this uh, railway is there. They are there already, but mm -hmm. you don't see them. Uh, it's uh, because uh, our limited perspective, uh, say our day-to-day -day consciousness, is too limited to see what is on the line. But it's not. It's not there. But it takes time before come uh, before we come there. Uh, Albert Einstein he said the only reason for time is so that not everything is happening all at once. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a yeah. that's yeah. a really good one. Yeah, I didn't know that one. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. but if you are in town A, just to make the metaphor complete here. Uh, You don't see the, that station, that station, that station, uh, or you don't see it, town B at all. But if you uh, are at uh, town A and go up in a helicopter, high, 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 high up, then suddenly you will see it, town B from town A. Yeah. So it is there. 
it's just depends on perspective. Already in town A, it's possible to see town B. Normally you don't do because you are on uh, say on the ground. But if you go up the helicopter, you can see it. And I think so. It's in our day to day working self consciousness. We don't see the future, but for some for on some perspective, the future is already there. Or at least some yes. basic yes. configuration of it is already there, and it will also be possible if you change gears of consciousness go into an alter states of consciousness uh, as i said go up in this helicopter metaphorically speaking so it depends on perspective and uh, therefore you can say that uh, as opposed to at least to the traditional reading of this akashic chronicles the future will also be part of an expanded uh, view of consciousness which i think we have to uh, say to heed if we are to get a um, what is called understanding of reality yes and to add maybe the magician would say okay the intention that you need is to take the helicopter to go up and see the future mm -hmm. right yeah, that's, a good one. that's that's yeah. That's, yeah. that's the next step that you take um, that's a good one Terry, um This was great. Would would be nice to go on forever, um, but yes. that shows us also that that there's so much in that book that we could talk about. Um, I have a final question for you. Um, uh, any any projects of yours that um, are somewhere hidden in your drawer and you want to talk about, or maybe a new book coming up or something that you would like to tell our audience here that they should be looking forward to from your end. You know, uh, I felt this this book is uh, the double size of a uh, say a typical book. Then, so That's so true. I feel <laughs> yes. And as you said, uh, each chapter is really I consider it a treasure trove of a different kind of anecdotes and, and scientific. And it boils down really concentrated. I must thank say. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. I hope it's funny also because I like to entertain. So yeah, uh, yeah. people it's say it's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a funny book also. So yes. it's not just uh, it's not formulas and that kind of things. It's yes. anecdote and good stories. <laughs> And, uh, yes, yes. True. laid back. So, so no, uh, I'm now working. Uh, the book is uh, has been in Norwegian. The first edition of the book, but uh, as you said, it's two editions in, uh, in in English, and it's also come in in Czech Czech in language. Right. Czech, yeah. Yes, and I'm working to try to get it out in Spanish now. Uh, so that is uh, um, and it's quite a lot of work because I don't have an. Uh, I fired my agent some uh, uh, years back, and he didn't. Uh, he he did not do what he was supposed. To. So okay. I think uh, yeah. I'll have to yeah. do this myself. So I, I'm working yeah. really too for promotion of my book and uh, getting into other languages uh, as many as possible. That very is good. My, very good. Yeah. German would be nice too, of course. Yes, yes. yes. I have been in contact with, and they really liked the book, but they was a bit uncertain uh, whether or not they would sell enough of it. To, mm -hmm. So because mm -hmm. the translation, you know, it's of course, quite mar markets get slower and and and, and yes. smaller and so COVID yeah. and yes. everything. So of course, yeah. yes, paper. Paper is yes. the thing at the moment. Yes. 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 Well, Terry, thank you so much for your time and for being with us here today on the Thoughts Hermes podcast. This was fascinating. Uh, it was a great first on the paranormal. And um, thank you for your input. Thank you for your deep knowledge and and being being uh, happy to share it with people um maybe you have some final word for all those people who are interested in the paranormal <laughs> out there you know i'm of course uh, not neutral here but i would say please buy my book you will learn so much and they also got practical tips for how to develop these uh, abilities yourself so uh, that is the best i can say how how, how could you be neutral but um, you can't how did how Since you can't be neutral on a moving train. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you for that. And yes, I can only support that. Do buy the book. It's a great book and um, um, it teaches you a lot. I have learned a lot from it. Thank you, Terje, and um, have a good rest of the day. And, um, thank you, Rudolf. Very nice having me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye for now.
Luna Nueva Alba by Patrick Usher. As always, you can find more how to find those musicians that we were hearing here today on the website in the show notes of this show. I think it's worth looking them up and really go more in depth into what they do as well. Not only our authors, but of course, also on the show notes, you find the links to where to buy the book, A Short History of Nearly Everything Paranormal by Terje, who was our guest today and who I really thank for being with us here today. It was a great talk that we had and a good opening into a new subject here on the podcast. And, uh, well, that is almost the end of this week. Um, the fourth podcast in the week, as I said, it's great. Um, and I will be most happy to also tell you now who will be here next week on this show. And I'm most excited to have learned uh, basically a few days ago that um, there will be finally a book on Peladon, um, Josephine Peladon, uh, the very interesting, very mystical French esotericist, occultist, who, which will be published this summer um, by Theon Publishing, that great um, publishing house uh, by Jessica Grotti and David Beth. And the book is, of course, written by Sasha Chaitov, who is the specialist on Josephine Peladon. And it is her who will be my guest here next week. So breaking news about this book that those breaking news were just released basically a couple of days ago. And um now we have already Sasha on the show next Sunday, and I'm most happy about that. Okay, well, next Sunday, that's already May the 1st, May Day. Amazing. It's how time flies. It's amazing. Okay, great. Well, thank you for listening. Have a good week. Come back next Sunday. And now it's just to tell you, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.